great to see lots of new faces for an AWARE event. Um, so really fantastic that you've all be made the time to come and join us. Thank you for being here. Um, for those of you who don't know, I'm Claire Ruddy. I'm Executive Director um, with Whistler's Environmental Charity, the Association for Whistler Area Residents for the Environment, or as we more um, briefly and lovingly refer to it as AWARE. Um, for those of you not familiar with our group, we've been around for a while, originally formed in 1989 to bring recycling to Whistler. Um, we've, we still do a lot of projects that are based on um, improving our waste management in the area, um, but our key priorities are safeguarding habitat, biodiversity and wilderness, connecting people with nature and building sustainable community. So we do have a booth in the expo, please do connect with our board members who are hosting that this evening. Um, but just to give you a little bit of who, information about who we are and why we're here tonight, um, I'd like to say that it's a privilege, um, say what a privilege it is to be here with you all. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge that we're gathered on the traditional territories of the Lilawat and the Squamish nations. And tonight we're joined by Josh and Stutha, uh, sorry, Shuta Ch uh, Chem, who are just hiding behind the curtain here, um, who on behalf of the Squamish Lilawat Cultural Center, um, are going to honor us with a blessing to open proceedings. So thank you for being here. Please go. Kutchnam Kalab, thank you very much, uh, Claire, and uh, Ware Whistler for uh, inviting us here this evening, uh, of course, to come and do a uh, traditional blessing, and of course, a welcome uh, for everyone to come here this evening. So Kukshta Murkulap Kwa Kukbeat. We'd like to thank the good creator for allowing us to be here this evening uh, to watch over us uh, in a good way you know, as we carry out this evening. We like to ask the good creator to watch over our families you know, while we're all here gathered in a good way uh, this evening. We like to thank the good creator for the water that we drink, you know, the food that we eat that helps us carry out you know, our day-to-day -day lives. So from here on, <coughs> so kakwao nchnuknukwa. Shik shik in squachicha litwat ul can, statlium can. So good evening, everyone. My name is Josh Anderson, and I come from the Liltwat Nation. My Uhwamuch name is Shik Shik, uh, which means powerful ground. And I'd like to welcome everyone uh, to our traditional territories of both the Skohomish and Liltwat Nations. And of course, uh, we're here as our cultural ambassadors uh, from the Skohomish Liltwat Ul Cultural Center. So I'd just like to welcome, you know, our friends, our family, and our honored guests, you know, that are here uh, to join us this evening. So at this time, we'd like to share a traditional song with you. It's a, our traditional welcome song. And our welcome song is to welcome, you know, friends, family, and guests into our traditional homes and into our traditional territories. Thank you very much, everyone, and please enjoy the rest of the evening, and uh, welcome uh, Elizabeth May uh, to our traditional territories of the Squamish and the Lilwet Nations. So, Kuchnam Kalap, welcome. Thank you, Josh and Shudachem. Thank you so much. Um, 
So this evening, I would really also, uh, I'd like to draw your attention also to the building that we're in. Um, the, I don't know if many of you have heard, but the Whistler Conference Center um, is actually notorious for getting lots of awards for um, sustainability in business. It was recognized last year as the Whistler Chambers, at the Whistler Chambers Excellence Awards as the sustainable business in Whistler. Um, and they actually were just awarded the level one APEX um, ASTM certification in sustainability. So we're actually speaking tonight in the only Canadian venue with the sustainability certification. So it's a special achievement for them. It's a big deal in the conference world. Um, and for the Whistler community. And it's also a great example of a business choosing to take on a leadership role in their industry and reaping the benefits of doing so. So um, it's a perfect fit for our talk tonight about um, people being proactive on issues like waste energy um, and, and taking responsibility for their footprint. Um, so to give you a quick overview of how things are going to flow through this evening, we're going to hand over shortly to the Honourable uh, Elizabeth May, um, who's our keynote speaker this evening. We're also going to uh, mix it up a little bit and have a, qu a question and answer period with just Elizabeth um, after she's presented. Then we're going to bring it um, down to our local leaders, elect, and MLA Jordan Sturdy is going to give us the provincial picture and some news about a public consultation that's coming up that we should all be aware of and um, getting ready to engage in. And then our... Um, Sea to Sky mayors, so um, Mayor uh, Richmond, and Nancy Wilhelm Morden, and uh, Heitzman are going to explore. The, we're going to sit and talk with them and explore the route from uh, these global climate commitments that were made in Paris to the more localized uh, climate actions that we can expect to see in the communities here in the Sea to Sky. So I'm actually going to hand over the most challenging task of the evening uh, here, which is introducing uh, Elizabeth May in just two minutes. Um, and to do that, I'm going to invite Ken Melamed to the stage. Uh, Ken was actually one of AWARE's founders back in 1989. Um, he's past Whistler councillor, uh, past two-term mayor, and most recently he's the uh, can a candidate for the Green Party. Um, and Ken also helped to uh, really get us rolling with this event when the seed was sown for, for doing an evening like this by putting in the initial ask to um, Elizabeth. So thank you, Ken, for putting in that ask, and thank you, Elizabeth, for saying yes. Um, so I'll hand over to Ken. Two minutes, Ken. That's your challenge. <laughs> thank you. Well, it's great to see everybody out. Thanks for braving the weather. Uh, I'm honored to be here on the stage to introduce Elizabeth, but I want to acknowledge the presence of uh, elected officials from the corridor and Jordan Sturdy, and I know also in the audience we have other uh, elected officials from uh, Squamish and Worcester Councils. So thanks to everyone. Uh, it is great to have Elizabeth here to share some of the stories about COP21 and her perspective on where we're going. You know, people have said COP21 is a failure, it's a success. I really don't care. I think we debate a lot about what, what we're doing. I think we're, the time for debate is over. I think we need to get down to action. And I hope tonight the result, the outcome will be to see the challenge. What kind of leadership will we take? What kind of role will, will, will we take in this corridor. It's really up to each and every one of us because uh, as Pogo said, we've seen the enemy and he is us. And the good news about that is if it's our responsibility, then we can take action. We can do it. So we shouldn't ask the question, what can we do? We should ask, what will we do? How bold will it be? Elizabeth May is uh, a, an incredible lady. I had the pleasure of working with her intimately in the, uh, over the last year. I'm so inspired by what she does. Uh, I would hate to describe you as a workaholic, but she seems tireless, like the ever-ready bunny. Uh, but really uh, knows so much about Canada and has been such a, a gift to all of us. So she's an environmentalist. She's a writer. She's written eight books. She's a lawyer and a leader of the Green Party of Canada. As senior policy advisor to Environment Minister Tom, McKill, Ma, Tom McMillan, she was involved in negotiating the Montreal Protocol, protecting South Moresby Park, uh, uh, bringing in new ozone layer protection, new legislation for pollution control measures. Uh, she was named an Officer of the Order of Canada in 2005. In November 2010, Newsweek magazine named her one of the world's most influential women. She is a mother, a grandmother, she makes her home in Sydney. In the 2000 election, Elizabeth made history by being the first Canadian Green Party candidate to be elected to the House of Commons. She now represents the riding of Saanich Gulf Islands. She's a one-woman show who is changing the face of democracy in Canada. She's been elected the hardest working parliamentarian and a favorite by all of her other members of, you know, one of the things Elizabeth said, she loves all of the people she works with. I got to hear her say so many great things over the 
the campaign. But she, she really genuinely does. And she can work across party lines to make things happen and, in fact, is making real change. So without further ado, I welcome Elizabeth May to the stage. Enjoy. Well, I, w I do want to thank Ken and, of course, Claire and everyone associated with AWARE. I know there's a lot of volunteers with AWARE here tonight, and I really appreciate it. And it's great to be on stage with mayors whom I know and to get to know Jordan. So I'm very grateful for this chance to bring something that happened at a high level uh, and make it more local, make it more real. I also want to start, again, and accepting the blessings and with great thanks, acknowledging the territory of the Squamish and Lewitt. First Nations. I have to say what an honor it was for me earlier today. I presented uh, in the final argument in the National Energy Board hearings on Kinder Morgan and the uh, fabulous work of Aaron Bruce and Squamish First Nation testimony was just ahead of mine. It was really, it was really an honor to, to sort of share that podium. So thank you again. I raise my hands to you for that gracious and generous welcome. Now, I have been asked to share with you what happened at the climate negotiations in Paris at COP21. There's a lot to cover. And uh, in it's, it uh, is a, histor a historical sweep that I want to cover that talks about where the negotiations came from, going back to the foundational document under which these negotiations have been happening every year. And that goes back to 1992 to the signing of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. I also want to try to give you a sense of the pathway since then, the science as it's gathered in its, its uh, intensity and the urgent warnings of scientists, and what actually happened. Because as Ken was saying, some people were saying, oh, it was a failure, it was a success. Well, what was it? What, what got agreed to there? And I want to try to do all this in a uh, as close to a half an hour as possible so that we have more time for your questions at that level and we can shift really, and I think it's really important to shift quickly to what's happening here in BC, what's happening at municipal level of government, what's happening provincially, because it's all very intimately connected. No one level of government, no one sector of society is going to avert the climate crisis. And there's a role for governments, First Nations governments and leadership, municipal order of government, provincial governments, federal, and acting globally together through things like the negotiations. So in some ways, I mean, people talk about COP21, and I found as I was preparing to go to yet another climate negotiation, and for a long time over the previous, well, 10 years in which uh, the, uh, Stephen Harper was prime minister, the strangest thing was, oh, there were many strange things, but one of the strange things was, that opposition members of parliament were not included on the government delegation. And this is a departure from everything. Um, Ken mentioned that I worked in the office of Tom McMillan when he was Minister of Environment from 86 to 88. And I wasn't a political person. I wasn't a member of any party. And I certainly wasn't a member of Brian Mulroney's party. But I ended up working for the Minister of Environment in that period, 1986 to 1988. And at the Rio Earth Summit in 1992, Brian Mulroney's administration not only had members of opposition parties on the delegation to Rio, they funded environment groups, development organizations, First Nations, women's groups, and youth to make sure that when the Government of Canada delegation went to the Earth Summit in Rio, we were there as Canada, not the party in power of the day. So it's been a long time since we've seen that. Back in 1986, when I first went to work for Tom McMillan, who was uh, the Minister of Environment, and he recruited me because he wanted a grassroots environmental activist in his office working on environmental issues uh, from you know his own political staff, which was, believe it or not, unusual to have someone who actually worked on environmental issues in the Ministry of Environment's office, but that's another story. It, it meant I had the enormous advantage of learning climate science from Environment Canada scientists before the myth of doubt was invented by the fossil fuel lobby. 
So I had the great good fortune to be working at a point where we just, we were solving acid rain and solving it. We were addressing the threat to the ozone layer and solving it. And we thought then, in 1986, 1987, 1988, that climate change would be like the other ones. We'd solve it. We divert disaster. So we had the climate models that said if we didn't act, we could be losing all our glaciers. If we didn't act, we'd lose Arctic ice. In those days, I thought, well, we'll act, and then those things won't happen. So it's been a very discouraging uh, number of decades of watching procrastination, uh, delay of all kind, and we've run out of time, right? We've completely run out of time for procrastination. So here's what happened, is that in 1992 at the Earth Summit, after two years of preparatory negotiations, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change was agreed to by all governments. I mean, we, the, the event at Rio at the Earth Summit had everyone speaking to that gathering from Fidel Castro to George Bush and accepting a convention to avert the climate crisis. Now, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change is a legally binding document, but its terms were vague. It basically set out in 1992 that all nations on Earth were committed to avoiding levels of anthropogenic climate change, in other words, uh, climate change caused by human activity, burning of fossil fuels, destroying of forests, that we were committed in 92 to avoiding levels that could be described as dangerous. And that's the word in the convention, in quotes, dangerous. So translating dangerous became the job of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which was formed in 1988. And we've gone through a long period of figuring out how do we avert what's dangerous. We haven't done well. As you know, I think all of you in this room will know that in, since 1992, levels of greenhouse gases have continued to rise all around the world, not averting what's dangerous. Now the term COP, refers to the UN Framework Convention of Climate Change. Every country that signs and ratified that convention, and by the way, we can be proud of the fact that Canada was the first industrialized country to both sign and ratify the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change in 1992. But every country that signed and ratified is referred to as a party. So the parties to the convention, once it entered into force when enough countries had signed and ratified to make it legally binding, Parties to the convention essentially meet every single year in what we could describe as the global climate parliament, only we call it the COP. So the conference of the parties is the acronym. COP3 happened in Kyoto, Japan. So you know what happened there. They negotiated the Kyoto Protocol, which was a really good instrument and actually designed and modeled on the Montreal Protocol that protected the ozone layer. There was no reason that, Montreal protocol, that, the, that the Kyoto Protocol shouldn't have worked as well as the Montreal Protocol, except for the intervention of the fossil fuel lobby and big bucks to derail Kyoto. So in a nutshell, my subtitle of this talk could be Good Cops and Bad Cops. <laughs> and we've had recently a whole lot more bad cops than we've had good cops. In fact, the really last good cop before Paris was the one that happened, the only one that ever happened in Canada, actually the only one that ever happened in Canada or the US, because the US has never hosted a climate negotiation, was the November 2005 COP when our current Minister of Foreign Affairs, who was then the Minister of Environment, Stéphane Dion, chaired the meeting. Now, chairing the meeting of a COP, another piece of vocabulary, is called being the president of the COP. And the president and staff, which is all UN staff at that point, is called the presidency. I may fall into using that term to describe France, so I want to make sure I've explained it first. That was our last really good cop. That was the last time I thought, yay, yay, we did it. We pulled it off. We got the very best possible negotiation we could possibly have gotten, and we got it in 2005. Unfortunately, we know what happened in domestic politics. So by 2006, we had a, a new president of the COP. And actually, the title president of the COP was inherited directly from Stefan Dion and went to Ron Ambrose. That's another story. The worst COP in the history of bad COPs was unquestionably 2009 in Copenhagen. 2009 in Copenhagen was a train wreck of a meeting. And if you're interested in question and answers to get into why that happened, I'm happy to give you my sense of perspective of what went wrong. It didn't help that Canada was trying to sabotage the negotiations. But we had loads of help 
from the Prime Minister of Denmark at the time and from a really bad strategy from Barack Obama. But 2009 was so bad that it actually put in question the whole idea that the UN system could come up with a treaty that included all countries and got us to reduce greenhouse gases fast enough to avoid those worst case scenarios out there. And the worst case scenarios are a long way from what I thought they were in 1986. The science, by the way, that the climate scientists gave the Minister of Environment and Prime Minister Brian Mulroney got the same briefings, never doubted the climate science, put Canada on a path to be one of the leader countries. But what we didn't see was the risk that if we did nothing at all over the period of a decade through the 1990s and through the first decade of the 2000s, that we would put ourselves at risk of triggering something called runaway global warming, where we would unleash natural forces through human intervention in the climate system that would create what are called positive feedback loops, where we could actually create a situation where nothing humanity did would make a difference anymore because we would have unleashed so much warming from natural events that were triggered by our unnatural intervention. So I get just give you a couple quick examples of what we have to avoid. For instance, we can't allow the permafrost of the world to melt because it contains enough methane to be the equivalent of four times as much as all the greenhouse gases humanity has created since the Industrial Revolution. So we really can't afford to lose our permafrost. We have to keep that frozen, uh, at least mostly frozen, because methane is a very powerful greenhouse gas, and if the permafrost melts, it releases the methane. Another example also from our Arctic. The more we lose Arctic ice, the more we lose something called the albedo effect. So the white Arctic ice on the top of the world uh, reflects back to space a lot of the sun's radiative heat and is a very powerful cooling mechanism for the whole planet. But as we lose Arctic ice from warming ocean water, the warm ocean water, or warmer relatively, we're still talking about the Arctic, is dark and pulls in the sun's radiative heat, thus speeding up. That's the problem with, speed, with feedback loops. They accelerate a rate of warming. So losing Arctic ice is a really critical thing that we have to arrest as quickly as we possibly can. There's a, there are a lot of other feedback loops. A drying, warming forest will release a lot of carbon if it burns. So we know that the science is telling us we have to act quickly. And starting from about from the 2009 Copenhagen talks, scientists began to put the long-term goals less in terms of how, what percentage of greenhouse gas we had to reduce, to what would be, back to the word dangerous, what would be a level of global average temperature increase that would give us a probability of survival? And when I say survival, I really think the, the likelihood is that human species will survive. Uh, what's really in jeopardy is whether human civilization, functional nation states, the ability to, to get ourselves out of this mess, that, that's what we have to, that, that's when I talk about survival. You know, a functional society of humanity where civilization uh, can operate to take care of each other. So to, to get to that, the scientists have advised that really, uh, and the numbers bop, sort of moved around for the last little while between 1.5 degrees Celsius global average temperature increase over what the temperature was before the Industrial Revolution, and 2 degrees Celsius was increasingly being used by countries around the world and nations as a level as though it was a safe zone. Right? Now, the problem with global average temperature increase is that 1.5 and 2 degrees will, for most people, not sound like a lot. And it's really hard to convince people that, that these figures are meaningful. As a matter of fact, I can't tell you how often through the election campaign I found sometimes other candidates, certainly people in the media, saying, oh, well, it's the 2%, right? We're looking at, no. To, you know, it, these are hard concepts, and, and it's very rare that anyone actually slows down and explains what we're talking about. So let me slow down and explain the difference in global average temperature increase of 1.5 degrees Celsius and 2 degrees Celsius, because this is directly relevant to why I feel what we accomplished in Paris really matters. It doesn't sound like a lot in a country like Canada, where certainly where most Canadians live, uh, you can go from minus 30 in winter to plus 30 in summer. So you've got a swing of, of 60 degrees Celsius in your normal year. So what's one? What's critical is understanding that global averages are huge. 
So the difference between global average temperature in 2016 and what it was at the time 10,000 years ago of the last ice age when Canada was under several kilometers of ice is five degrees. Five degrees global average temperature is the difference between globally 2016 and globally 10,000 years ago. 1.5 degrees is huge. One degree, we're already committed to one degree. We're almost there now. 1.5 degrees is also huge. Two degrees is more dangerous and so on. And that runaway global warming effect where we unleash so much CO2 that we can no longer control the warming and it self accelerates, that's super dangerous and no one's exactly sure when that might happen. Uh, certainly, there's a point where if you start talking about we go above three, do we go to four? At a certain point, so, uh, many scientists think, well, you go four, you're going to go five, you're going to go six, you're going to go seven. It will self-accelerate and you can't stop it. So the sooner we ensure that global average temperatures are uh, beginning to, to be arrested at 1.5 in that range, the better. The sooner we arrive at a concept called peaking that we stop having greenhouse gas levels rise globally year after year, realize, okay, that was the highest year ever and now we're coming down. So these are some of the key concepts that the global negotiations have been grappling with. So after 2009, when everything went off the rails, the first conference after that, COP16, took place in Mexico. And I mention that because everybody who cares about climate should know the name Patricia Espinosa who was the Minister of Foreign Affairs in Mexico who rescued the whole process. She is the one who convinced governments that had seen such bad faith bargaining, such outrageously bad behavior from the industrialized world, but particularly from the way that the Cop Copenhagen meeting was organized, that there was a reason for developing countries around the world to doubt the bona fides, to doubt the integrity of the whole process. So thanks to uh, Patricia Espinoza and COP16, the beginnings of a framework that people could trust each other, and I mean people, 195 governments around the world could get back together and begin the process of planning for the next effort to have a real convention. Uh, it got put further on the road the following year when we gathered in Durban. Durban, by the way, was my first COP attending as a member of parliament. Um, and I was able to get there and participate fully, not with my own government, of course, but I was, I could have couch surfed delegations for a while there. Uh, Durban was when I was a member of the delegation for Papua New Guinea and uh, worked very hard in that process with my Green Party friends from around the world who were often also ministers of environment for their own countries and, and participating fully. Anyway, Durban created something called the um, Durban Platform for Enhanced Action, and believe it or not, for the four years since Durban, all we were doing was negotiating the thing I'm holding in my hand, which was right before we went to Paris, 55 pages, not a single word of which had been agreed to by anybody. And that was the basis of the opening of negotiations when they started in Paris. Now, I have to say it occurred to me frequently, attending COP21 for the first time as a member of Parliament for Canada and wearing the badge of a member of the delegation of my own government, and I was so extraordinarily pleased and grateful for that. So I do think that publicly, uh, a thank you to Justin Trudeau and the new incoming government to do what was both normal and expected, but boy, I, it was, it really, it really helped to recognize that opposition members of parliament had a place on the delegation, and so too did First Nations and Inuit and Métis, so too did environmental groups, and other orders of government. Every single province and territory premiers were invited and they participated fully, as well as Canadian youth. It was back, I mean, it really, I mean, I know it's what Justin says, so maybe I shouldn't just repeat what the Prime Minister says, but yeah, hey, Canada was back. It felt great. It felt great to be back as a country and not watch us under one party's pressure actually drag things backwards. What did we actually accomplish at COP21? Well, it was tough because a lot of the things we should have had as tools to develop a really strong treaty were taken away from climate negotiators decades ago. 
the Montreal Protocol on the Ozone Layer, which I've mentioned, was a legally binding treaty which had enforcement mechanisms that said that if any country in that treaty started manufacturing and using ozone-depleting substances against the language of the treaty, they could be punished. And the punishment was through trade sanctions. That was 1987. By 1997, when we went to Kyoto, the opportunity to have an enforceable treaty with trade sanctions had been removed from climate negotiators by some lobbying pressure from the newly created World Trade Organization. So that is an ongoing issue of concern. How much power do trade deals have? How much can they undercut climate agreements? But in the case of the Kyoto Protocol, it was legally binding. The targets were legally binding in the treaty, but the treaty had no enforcement mechanisms. And we had not gotten enforcement mechanisms back before Paris. So that wasn't something we could use, unfortunately. I don't know. It makes no sense. These are all the same governments, right? 195 governments negotiate trade deals. 195 governments also stand up at UN meetings and say climate crisis is the biggest threat to our survival, this biggest threat to our children's future. But these climate negotiators, they can't have the real tools. Like trade negotiators, if you picture their workshop, they've got, you know, big table saws, they got jigsaws, they got exacto knives. They're allowed to use real tools. Climate negotiators, we get the plastic rounded scissors that the kindergarten class might be able to use so we don't hurt ourselves or get in the way too much. So that's a problem and I acknowledge it. But given the thin gruel that we had to work with at the opening of the climate negotiations, which was this 55-page ADP working group, Advanced Durban Platform for Enhanced Action, how did we get that into something that could be used to actually avert disaster? We got at every single level, almost every level, there was one issue that we missed out on, and I'll mention what it is. It was at one draft of the treaty that became Paris Accord there were references to acting on international aviation and international maritime shipping. That's a big gap because when a plane takes off from Heathrow and lands at JFK, who's responsible for the emissions? Rather than dealing with that issue, it's still not being dealt with, and international aviation and international shipping is a substantial part of global greenhouse gas emissions, about 6%. So we do need to get to that. But other than international aviation and shipping, at every single issue, every single paragraph, every single possible outcome, we got what was the best possible under, uh, with the language we had. We hit levels of commitment that nobody really expected. And Canada was a big help in that. So we got two agreements out of Paris. One is the Paris Agreement, which is a legally binding treaty that will come into effect once it's been signed and ratified, back to that same principle I mentioned about becoming a party to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. The UN Framework Convention on Climate Change remains the umbrella overarching agreement. The Paris Agreement will come into force as a legally binding agreement once 55 countries have ratified it, and those 55 countries have to represent the equivalent of 55% of global greenhouse gas emissions. The other thing that we negotiated is called the COP decision. Now that's just the decision of the annual meeting of the Global Climate Parliament, and it's the work plan. The big distinction between these two things is that the Paris Agreement doesn't come into effect till 2020. COP decision from Paris, COP 21 decision, is a work plan that's already in effect. It's already dictating what are we doing in April, what are we doing in May, what are we doing next year when the COP 22 meets in Marrakesh, it's, it's an ongoing work plan. The reality of it is, and this was one of the biggest successes out of COP21, was, and Canada was one of the first industrialized countries to shift to this position. So we have to avoid, if we possibly can, allowing global average temperature to go above 1.5 degrees Celsius. Catherine McKenna is our new Minister of Environment and Climate Change. She took that position at the midway point of the negotiations when we shifted from the early stage of a week of negotiating between bureaucrats the text suitable for becoming a treaty, which was finalizing the work of the ADP group. Second week started with the COP itself with ministerial level negotiations, in other words, elected people. So at that first session on the Sunday night of the COP at midpoint was when Catherine McKenna took the position that Canada wants a legally binding treaty and we should avoid going above 1.5 degrees Celsius. 
It was a big statement, and it helped move other countries. Now, 1.5 degrees Celsius for the developing world, a lot of developing countries, well, in Copenhagen, there was a walkout by the African nations when things were getting really bad. And they were chanting 1.5 to stay alive. For low-lying island states, if we go above global average 1.5 degrees Celsius, they're all underwater for good. So 1.5 degrees Celsius really matters. Can we avoid 1.5? Not if we wait till 2020 to get serious about this issue. So that's one of the key points of this treaty, is that there's actions that we take in under a legally binding treaty that begin in 2020, and there's actions we take before that under the COP decision. Key to the negotiations was also a substantial co a commitment of industrialized countries based on a promise that was made by the U.S. president at Copenhagen when nobody wanted to hear the U.S. promising money. What they wanted to hear was the U.S. promising to reduce emissions. But they put it out there that by the year 2020, there would be $100 billion a year mobilized from multiple sources, governments, uh, international financial institutions, private sector. They weren't quite sure where it would all come from. But first Hillary Clinton and then Barack Obama promised in Copenhagen $100 billion a year in a green climate fund. That's now been recommitted in the COP decision with clear language referencing it in the Paris Agreement that's legally binding treaty. Let me tell you some other cool things about what this does. How do we make a treaty like this work when I've already told you there's no enforcement mechanisms? And by the way, none of the targets that countries are taking are in the treaty itself. Now, in a lot of ways, that's the good news. Because if you take the total number of targets that countries around the world have filed with the UN through the process of the Durban effort, every country was asked to table in calendar 2015 how much they're prepared to reduce greenhouse gases, what they're prepared to do about the crisis for climate. And if you take all of those promises together, and the UN system has done this, and you add them up, let's just assume every country meets all its promises. Do we avoid two degrees? Do we avoid 1.5? No. On current collective promises in aggregate, we go to somewhere between 2.7 degrees Celsius global average temperature increase to 3.5 degrees. So current pledges from all governments are about double what's needed. We need to cut those promises. We need to have, well not cut the promises, we need the promises to cut emissions by another doubling of what in UN language gets called ambition. So how are we going to move a bunch of countries that say, and believe me, starting November 30th with speeches from actually 150 of the heads of government showed up to speak on the first day. So in addition to Prime Minister Trudeau, in addition to President Obama and C Chancellor Angela Merkel, and of course the host country France, and of course uh, Hollande and, and Paris, and everyone had just gone two weeks earlier through the horrors uh, of the murders and the attacks in Paris. So it was, a very, it, was, it was a difficult and stressful time to be holding the climate negotiations at all. But Putin was there and spoke, and the president of China, everyone was there, and they're all speaking in elevated, uh, you know, the oratory was uh, inspirational. They sounded really committed to reducing greenhouse gases. But all their targets, taken all together, take us to twice too far. So how do we get those countries to actually do what's needed? Well, this is the new idea that's in the Paris Agreement, and it starts under the COP decision with the notion of what is called in the agreement global stock taking. So essentially, the enforcement mechanism under the new treaty is global peer pressure. Because every five years, not waiting, like Kyoto was in 97, and the deadline for emissions reductions was 2012. I think everybody involved in climate negotiations now understands you can't give countries 15 years to see if they're keeping their word. You go on regular check-ins, sort of on, I hadn't thought of this before, it's sort of a big carbon diet, and this is Weight Watchers, you're going to have to weigh in. So the, the first check-in point for a global stock take is under the COP decision, because we can't wait till 2020. So the first global stock take is described as a facilitative dialogue, but it's basically the same thing. It's going to be in 2018. And governments are going to be asked at that point to look at their existing targets. You can replace your target at any time. 
because it's not housed in the treaty, it's in the UN system, it's, it's on file with the Secretariat. You can remove your target and put in a new target, an, uh, can remove an old target, put in a new target at any time. The only rule is no backsliding. You can't put in a weaker target, you can only ratchet up. So these are some of the concepts that you heard a lot if you were in the hallways in Paris. Ratcheting up mechanisms being a key deliverable we had to have. Global stock take on a five-year basis. Starting early, as early as possible, 2018. Again in 2020. Constantly ratcheting up to make sure that we're reducing emissions fast enough to avoid 1.5 degrees global average temperature increase. Tough to do. I know a lot of scientists think, well, we might have to overshoot 1.5 and get back to it through more aggressive work in things like replanting the planet's mangrove forests. Because mangrove forests have the large advantage of being significant biomass, really good carbon sinks. We've eliminated more than a third of the world's mangroves in coastal areas. They grow fast, and unlike other forests, they're unlikely to catch fire because they're rooted in water. You don't want to lose your carbon sinks. And you don't want them going up in smoke. This is a very ambitious agenda that Paris set in place. And if we take them at their word, the leaders of governments from 195 countries have just committed our societies, our economies, all nations, to go off fossil fuels completely as soon as possible. We've committed to ensure that the global peak of greenhouse gas emissions is as soon as possible. There is speculation that we may hit it in 2015 and start going down from there. 2014 was the first year where global greenhouse gas emissions really seemed to stall. They separated out from economic growth. GDP grew at a greater rate and s uh, carbon dioxide emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, almost stalled. They went up a bit, but it was an encouraging sign. Could 2015 be the first year where they start going down? China's promised some pretty big things. By 2020, China has promised to bring on board 250 gigatons of hydro, I mean of wind, 250 gigatons of wind and 200 gigatons of solar. A gigaton, by the way, is 1,000 megawatts. It's a, it's a lot of energy. That is one of the reasons that the price of solar photovoltaic panels has dropped so much around the world that right now, if you're looking at a new installation, solar is cheaper than coal over the lifetime of the project. There are some good indications out there. Just have to, before leaving the Paris summit, say, so much in life and so much in history depends on who's in the room. It really matters that our election was October 19th and not December 19th. I don't think we would have gotten the Paris Agreement under our previous government because whether Canadians know it or not and whether our national media wants to tell us this or not, Canada plays a big role in the world. We've always punched above our weight. When we punch above our weight with the, on the side of the angels, we do a lot of good. And when we punch above our weight to bring things backwards and to stop progress towards reducing greenhouse gas emissions, unfortunately, we were also very effective. Tribute must also be paid to the president of this COP. His name's Laurent Fabius. He's the uh, current foreign affairs minister for France. He's a socialist. I think that helped, actually. I think in bridging a north-south divide, it helped that Laurent Fabius came from a socialist party. He was once prime minister of France when Mitterrand was president. And someday someone will do a, a biography of Laurent Fabius, and, or maybe it'll even be a movie. But up until this moment, the thing for which he would have been known in any kind of an environmental review of his career would have been the moment when Mitterrand Made Law Fabius be the person who went before the media to take responsibility on behalf of the government of France for blowing up Rainbow Warrior in Auckland, New Zealand Harbor and killing a Greenpeace photographer on board from France. So Lohan Fabius, in his personal, compelling, strong work ethic, his call to every one of those negotiators to think of their own families, their own kids, to know we couldn't fail here was really a big part of why we succeeded in Paris. In fact, I think if in 2009, if the negotiations at COP15 had been in France with Laurent Fabius chairing instead of in Copenhagen with Prime Minister Rasmussen chairing, I think we would have gotten something 
really good out of Copenhagen. That 2009 moment was, was stolen from us by a, a bunch of uh, really unfortunate um, just cards that we were dealt, if you put it that way. But now what we have is a real challenge. As Canadians, we still have the same target nationally that we had under the previous government. It was tabled with the UN in May of 2015. Um, our new Prime Minister has pledged that there will be a new target and a plan, at least the target part and a framework for action on climate within 90 days after COP. That was in the Liberal platform. That gives them until March 12th. I was really, really inspired and pleased that he brought together all of the First Ministers. The first First Ministers Conference in years took place in Ottawa on the Monday before COP opened and in it with a public science briefing for all first ministers. There will be a meeting November 28th and 29th of the Canadian Council for Ministers of the Environment. That's in Ottawa. They'll be looking at and grappling with this issue. Nothing could be more important for British Columbians right now than to pay a lot of attention to the upcoming consultations on what BC can do to improve our own targets and improve our own behavior and do what we can at every level, First Nations, municipal, provincial, territorial, federal, personal, business, whatever we can do to help reduce emissions fast enough for Justin Trudeau as Prime Minister to be able to table a new target when he, and I hope he will go personally, there's a signing ceremony for the Paris Agreement will be taking place uh, in, uh, in New York at the UN headquarters on Earth Day this year, April 22nd, 2016. So that's, I give, I, I went a little over what I wanted to do in a half an hour. I've taken 35 minutes, so I'm sorry. But I'm hoping to have whatever interests you in this question, ask anything about where we are now. I'm just enormously grateful to a lot of people. So I'm going to say it again. I'm leader of the Green Party of Canada, but credit where credit's due. Thank you to Catherine McKenna. Thank you to Stéphane Dion. Thank you to Justin Trudeau. And thank you to every Canadian who ever wrote a letter, who ever signed a petition, who ever demanded that this country do more and save our kids' lives. Thank you. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna let Elizabeth stay up at the podium, but uh, I'm gonna invite questions. We've got microphones at the front on each side, so if people who have um, questions that they'd like to ask don't just want to approach the microphone, and we'll alternate from side to side. So, um, can we bring up the house lights so I can see the people who ask the yeah, questions? Can we do that? Can we do that, Ed, at the back? Yeah. He's running around. I can see him. Can't see much else, but I can see him. <laughs> Sorry, just. <laughs> Yeah, that's, thank you. And so now you can see with them. Oh, there's a question, the first mic. I'll go first, get it started, see if anybody else wants to join me after. Um, I'm Sarah Jennings, um, and uh, I want to, I know we're going to be going local government, but I want to bring it down to local as in individual. Um, I <coughs> constantly go between being completely discouraged um, and trying to be opt optimistic. I have to be optimistic, as, I, as you know, as someone who's passionate about this work, um, as I am as well, um, you have to focus on the optimistic, but I continually see locally people who call themselves environmentalists, who don't behave in a way that reflects the type of world that they want to see as far as reducing climate change. Um, for instance, just within Whistler, um, we continue to see the number of uh, uh, personal vehicles increase um, on the roads, and um, snowmobiling is a very fast-growing sport in the neighbor in the in the um, corridor, and this concerns me in a town that is considered quite green. So, how, as an individual who is passionate about the environment, what is the best way to try to bring that down to the individual level when trying to um, encourage people to take personal responsibility for change? The route to encourage every single person to take personal responsibility for change will take us past 1.5. We need to increase the carbon fuel tax. It needs to cost more to ride around in a snowmobile. It needs to be, we need to send people the signal, and we need a lot more investment in infrastructure that makes it convenient for people. A lot of people have to drive a car. They have to drive a car for work. They have to drive vehicles that are gas guzzlers for many reasons. So if we make it all about the personal, it's really hard. 
we have to change the structure of the society so that it becomes easier. For instance, we need to have uh, tax rebates. We used to have them at the federal level to buy a hybrid or an electric car. We need to encourage that behavior while discouraging uh, the the use and waste of carbon based fuels. So it's 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 a bit of both. Uh, it's really hard. It's hard not to want to tell someone that you think is an environmentalist. You know, do you realize what you're doing? It's terrible. But guilt isn't a good motivator. Guilt's a really bad motivator. I, I definitely I think people would try to see. I try not to focus on that. But it is like so. How do you how do you get people to act actively work towards that? So how do you get people to stand up and ask for that and demand that? We tried to bring in pay parking. Um, the previous council, and they got shot down, and that council no longer, I mean, it, there was a lot of reasons, but that was just one reason, one way that we, we were trying to, as a community, promote a change by making people pay more for an activity that increases um, uh, emissions, and it was completely shot down. I mean, and, and in particular in a community like this where the economic health and future of this community is rarely, I mean, one of those industries that's really tied to climate change is any any winter ski industry it needs to have the, you know, we, we need to have a, ma a stable climate and one that's cold in winter. So we really do have a very strong argument to be made, but I think it's it's the structural things, it's working on consultation to the provincial government, which starts very soon, and Jordan will tell you more about that. It's working to, you know, encourage people through education. Letters to the editor are one of those ways of calling into radio shows, whatever you can do to create what is, you know, sharing that message that we're now really embarking on uh, a moment that a lot of us have been waiting for for a long time, planning for the complete phase out of fossil fuels. Once people realize that other governments are serious, that they've taken that target, we're going to be off fossil fuels, that we're looking at new technologies that actually deliver all the services we want, services of mobility, services of light and heat, and do it in ways that create more self-sufficiency. We're, we're, if we have solar photovoltaic tiles on our roofs, uh, and you know, and we're selling power into the grid. BC Hydro at this point will actually give you a check if you net out that you've sold them more energy than you've used in the course of a year. There are a lot of things that are shifting and changing. So I think the best way to get people on board is to say, be part of something that's happening now that's extremely exciting, that's a transformational economic uh, opportunity, and it is an opportunity. It creates more jobs, it's going to create a more prosperous society, and it, it definitely also has the fringe benefit of protecting the future that we want for our community and for our kids and their kids. I mean, I, I, I don't want to sound trite about it. I know it's hard, but this is a moment where things are going to shift in a big way, and the policy tools, the pricing signals, making it easier for people to do the right thing is the key to ensuring that we make the transition. Well, I like that. Focus on that it's an exciting time. It is very okay. exciting. Thanks, Sarah. Okay, thank we'll move over here. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Lori Parkinson. I live in North Vancouver, and I have a cabin on Boyer Island, which is in the mouth of House Sound. So I've been really involved to do with LNG. My question is, um, will scrapping uh, CEA 2012 to uh, end up restricting global temperature increase to 1.5, or what else is necessary? You mentioned increasing carbon taxes. Well, there's a lot that's necessary. There's mm -hmm. a, um, so CIA 2012 is the uh, result of the omnibus budget bill C38 that was brought in in spring of 2012, which actually, essentially we have no environmental assessment, the way that CIA that, that 2012 is so bad and so gutted. That by itself, though, doesn't get us very far. That just means we assess projects. We'll be able to go back to assessing projects, taking into account the greenhouse gas impacts. Uh, pricing, uh, pricing has been promised by the new federal government. Pricing carbon, removing all subsidies for carbon has been promised. But the range of things that we're going to have to do, it's a very long list indeed, and as I said, I think most of them are exciting. Uh, at the federal level, there are you know, some very mundane things, like the federal government controls building codes. We need building codes that don't allow what we currently have, which is a building stock where 30% of greenhouse gases in Canada come from buildings that are leaky. So we spend money heating the outdoors in the winter and cooling the outdoors in the summer. It makes no sense. So we're also going to have to unleash a lot of... Uh, 
programs aimed at getting carpenters and electricians and plumbers to take existing leaky buildings and plug those leaks. We're going to have to put a lot of the money that the federal liberals promised on infrastructure into green-only infrastructure. And I think they're likely to move in that direction. I certainly hope so. So public transit to make sure that people have a convenient alternative to getting in their car. Uh, there, the range of things that provinces can do is also a long list. I think we have to do a lot more with local food and food security. There's a range of things, and all of them, I think, actually all of them contribute to health and quality of life. Being a more active society, doing more to ensure that people have safe walking spaces as well as safe biking spaces wherever you're living, but particularly in our denser metropolitan areas, so people don't have that pressure that they have to get in their car to get from A to B and then often an inconvenient D that isn't just easy to do on current bus or, or uh, electric car, uh, subway routes. Do you have a feeling for whether the federal government is planning to make it financially easier to buy electric cars? I think it's absolutely. I think it's extremely likely because it was in place under the Liberals up till 2006 when Stephen Harper canceled it. So I think our chances of getting programs that were in place before, they just, mm -hmm. for instance, Eco Energy, uh, I met earlier, is it, is it Luke who does energy audits in here in Whistler? I can't remember if I got your name right. But we need people who are uh, who are excited about taking their homes and making sure they're as energy efficient as possible, uh -huh. uh, it, having a tax rebate for that makes yeah. tons of sense. Yeah. It was a hugely popular program. Do I think the Liberals will bring it back? Well, they invented it. Harper killed it, so I think we'll get it back. Yeah. Uh, tax rebates on buying a hybrid or an electric vehicle, they used to be there. They were canceled. Mm -hmm. It's the new innovative things. How far will we go on, for instance, an east-west electricity grid to ensure what we can get yeah. all fossil fuels out of producing electricity in every province in Canada as soon as possible, as fast as possible? So when you look at the climate crisis in its, its entirety, it can be paralyzing. But if you take bite-sized chunks, mm -hmm. like, okay, what are we going to do about this? What are we going to do about that? We can do this. We can do that. Ge you know, BC has huge potential for tidal power as well as geothermal, as well as solar roofing tiles, as well as wind. So while we have an electricity provider that's called BC Hydro, the range of renewables that we haven't touched at all is more than the equivalent of all the current electricity we're using in BC. We could be exporting that to help other places like Alberta shut down their coal. And I don't mean Site C. So thank you. <laughs> okay, just uh, oh, we're just gonna we're just fine. in the interest okay. of making thank you. Thanks. So over the side. Uh, hi there. Uh, my name's Nick. Um, my question is just touching on uh, the ambitions um, that you mentioned uh, during some of the UN uh, mm -hmm. climate. Um, and really, what I'm wondering is how or who is responsible for making sure that um, these ambitions that are put forward by countries, 195 countries from around the world, um, are met, and that. Uh, in order to have consistency, um, who will be responsible for making sure that uh, countries are continue to ratchet up? Because uh, I believe, I think, consistency throughout the 195 is um, kind of critical to avoiding uh, these key thresholds in the environment. Well, it's true, and, and, and the, the who's responsible is the collectivity of all the countries together through this process of global stock taking. So it's a, it's a new, approach. Uh, it, it, there was part of global stock taking and ratcheting up was a bit part of the Montreal Protocol, but we had the benefit of uh, trade sanctions as enforcement mechanisms. I think we do need to push for a global review of some of the trade measures and the non-trade measures that masquerade as trade measures, like the investor state agreements around the world, so that we can actually make sure that uh, the trade world doesn't undercut and undermine the work that needs to be done for climate. But the language is, you know, the language in the agreement is very clear that we need to pursue efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees C above pre-industrial levels. Uh, and further down, there's a goal to achieve a long-term temperature goal set out above this 1.5. Parties aim to reach global peaking of greenhouse gas emissions as soon as possible, recognizing that peaking will take longer for developing country parties, undertake rapid reductions. There's, there's very clear commitments here that all countries are undertaking when they ratify. Holding them to it and making sure it's consistent is the work of global citizens, it's the work of citizens within every country, as well as all the governments around the world. Uh, the, the, the reason that I think governments will pursue this 
is that there are no longer governments out there, except for Saudi Arabia, that don't want anything to happen at all. Uh, you look at China, they know if they lose the Tibetan ice sheet, they lose the source of water to five major rivers of Asia. Billions of people depend on that water. What it would mean in geopolitical terms, in instability, political instability, if they lose the Tibetan ice sheet, which is sometimes called the third pole. But if we keep, if, if global warming isn't arrested at about 1.5, the survival of the, of the Tibetan ice sheet is at risk. If we, if we go to two degrees, our probability risks for losing the Greenland ice sheet go up. If we lo lose the Greenland ice sheet, it's seven to eight meters of sea level rise. So when you look at those scale of risks, and you've got, you know, for, for Barack Obama, he's got the Pentagon advising him of the security risks of climate change. I mean, UK Prime Minister has a very engaged defense department in the UK Warming about warning what it means in geopolitical terms of increased conflict and war. The, the Syrian refugee crisis had its roots in at least one major factor being climate change and the persistent drought in Syria that drove so many people back in 2011. There were, there were already displaced people within Syria and the civil war hadn't really taken off yet. It was because they were moving from the countryside where they couldn't grow food anymore, moving into Damascus where they couldn't afford to buy food. So political instability and major extreme weather events around the world uh, are, are drivers for a lot of governments to realize that this isn't an environmental issue of feel good things so they can win a new badge on their Boy Scout uniform. This is survival and they're really, I think, at a basic level, a lot of governments around the world really do understand that getting off fossil fuels as quickly as possible is essential. Thank you. So, do you want to move to the next panel yet, or are you okay? Um, I'm going to ask Val to come up and ask a question, because we did talk earlier, and he had a good one. So I'm going to sneak in there, Val. Thanks. <coughs> Just lift up the mic here a little bit. Elizabeth, um, thank you so much for the really inspiring speech tonight. Um, I'm Val when I, I run the Whistler Chamber of Commerce up here. And my question, um, although not exclusively about climate change, um, is actually about environmental and land advocacy. Mm -hmm. And so as a chamber, obviously we do a lot of advocacy work. Um, and I should note, um, because it's really kudos to this community, that um, there's only two chambers in British Columbia that wrote letters against Northern Gateway Pipeline, and that was the Whistler Chamber of Commerce and uh, the Tofino Chamber of Commerce. Um, so I think our business organization, as a business support organization, we're a little bit unique. Um, as far as chambers go. Um, but uh, for a number of years, there has been dialogue in the corridor around uh, building another ski resort just about 30 minutes south of here. And my question is um, actually about the terms crown and public land. So we have, we have the term crown land in Canada, as you know. In the US, the, the, the uh, equivalent essentially would be public land. And I'm wondering, um, the words we use to describe our environment, how they are hamstringing us from effective advocacy. So I'll bring it back to the ski resort just down, down the highway a little bit, the proposed development. Um, because it has gone in as a ski resort application, the developers, the proponents for the project will gain access to some of the most pristine land in Canada for about $5,000 an acre. And what I'm wondering is, if we were somehow able to change the paradigm a little bit, and I understand there's, um, We've, we've got a queen that we have to convince. Um, but if we were calling our crown land public land, would we feel different about it? And would people show up differently um, in terms of how they support and, and choose to advocate for against these, these incredible tracts of land? So the question is really about advocacy. It's about the words we use to describe our environment. And do you see opportunities to start changing the actual words we use? Well, that's a fascinating question, Val. Thank you, and I congratulate the Whistler Chamber of Commerce. I also, in my writing, I have very cool chambers of commerce. I have Salt Spring Island Chamber of Commerce and Sandwich Peninsula Chamber of Commerce with a real big focus on affordable housing from the Sandwich Peninsula Chamber of Commerce. So, um, it, it, like everything else, what you put in as a local volunteer and as a community-minded citizen really can change the flavor of um, establishment organizations as well as how the community speaks out on issues. Now this is a really interesting question because crown land to me has always meant public land but when you think about it it does tend to convey something a little separate from us and of course the crown and right of Canada is really the federal government so um, you know no, no offense to Her Majesty uh, she uh, doesn't really she's the head of state for Canada which I think is cool 
I have to say, I think it's very cool to have a head of state who's ceremonial and a head of government who's elected who shouldn't think of themselves as, a, for instance, as a king or an emperor. I think it's really important that they recognize they're just normal mortals. Um, <laughs> just a wild thought. So, um, <laughs> and I think actually, you know what? Uh, it, you guys are going to think I'm really. Uh, Justin Trudeau has done a lot in creating the cabinet and the letters of mandate and the way he's conceived of what the role of a prime minister is, he's actually brought it back to where it should be, and ironically, the person who started wrecking it was his father. So it's, uh, I don't know, there's kind of a Star Wars theme happening here, a <laughs> generational thing. Um, but, but really, uh, what Justin Trudeau has done in the way he's conceived of himself is, by the way, up until Pierre Trudeau, all Canadian prime ministers understood that it wasn't a full-time job to be prime minister. It's not the person who runs the country. It's not the CEO of Canada, Inc., nor is it the king. It is to be sort of the chair of a board of people who are as a cabinet table, all responsible for doing their, their jobs properly. Uh, Justin Trudeau is the first prime minister since Lester B. Pearson to keep for himself two cabinet portfolios. In addition to being prime minister, he's also minister for intergovernmental affairs. He's also minister for youth. So back to your idea. Words do convey things to us. And if you talk about it as public land, or as the Squamish Nation representatives today did at the NEB, said, we don't call it territory. We don't like to call it the project area. We call it home. And I think the more we call the land where we are our home, and the more we recognize that all parts of sacred creation are, in fact, sacred, we will take very different care of our home. We don't have another place to go, and every little bit of it matters. And that's the kind of message where it's not a NIMBY thing, it's not not in my backyard, it's recognizing if every single person treats their own backyard and their home as something that is collective and shared. And if you look at the Chilcotin decision, which I think is one of those brilliant things the Supreme Court has ever done, but it, it's guidance for all of us, it's not just a, not that that's minimizing it at all, it's not a decision just to clarify what First Nations title is. I think if we looked at it as non-indigenous people and said, right, that's what our title should mean too. Because what the Supreme Court said in the unanimous judgment written by the Chief Justice, uh, by uh, she's just brilliant, uh, Chief Justice McLaughlin, she said, look, title is title is title. And for First Nations title, it is collective and it is intergenerational. If we could start taking that approach to our own lands, whether privately owned, or government held in trust for us for future generations as public land. I think you're onto something, Val. Maybe just stop calling it crown land. But it does have a, it is, as you know, it, it does suggest that maybe the queen might be in there someday having tea with friends and we shouldn't you know, surprise her too much. But anyway, um, we don't want to, uh, that's one of the uh, offenses under the criminal code is alarming the queen. So um, <laughs> I don't think she'd be alarmed if we started calling it public land. Thank you. And back over here. Thank you. Um, and thank you for that response. I feel as though uh, this question really follows on from your response to Val and to Sarah as well. Um, I recently did a summit um, at the Cultural Center here in Whistler, bringing together some of the, the w leaders in the world in the new economy, the peer-to-peer -peer movement, the open systems movement. Um, my question to you is, how do you see their role acting in the mitigation of climate change, and how do you think, how, how is the, uh, the Government of Canada supporting that? Well, I don't think we, we know yet how the Government of Canada is supporting that, but I do think social entrepreneurs, the role of civil society is going to be embraced more, I hope, in the coming months when we start seeing what actual climate plans are going to be rolled out. So we know that social entrepreneurs have done amazing things in creating and moving faster than governments ever could in seizing the moment and moving fast. Uh, one of the things I love, and i just give you one little example from my, my writing of Salt Spring Island has a Gulf Island Secondary School. Now this may not reflect the groups you're working with here, but you know, the, they fundraised and we put um, solar panels on the roof of the high school. Solar panels on the roof of the high school now fund solar scholarships to graduating high school students. They started community gardens at the school. The kids at the school are growing food, which now they've restored. What a radical concept. The school actually has a kitchen. And the food in the cafeteria is made locally from the gardens where the kids grew the food themselves. The more that we connect each other with our local sense of, of um, 
agency, our ability to do things ourselves, take things in our own hands. It's more, the, part of what brought the climate crisis to the point where it is is a consumer society that wanted to teach us helplessness. Political helplessness, functional helplessness. I mean, it's very, very good for fast food franchises and microwavable pizza pops if no one knows how to grow food, real basic stuff. But the more that we, in a society, whether it's a social entrepreneur movement or peer-to-peer -peer or however it's organized, the more that we mobilize, we actually create a much healthier society. Reducing alienation in kids, reducing that sense of helplessness is key to our restoring a sense of an engaged citizenry, and actually a, a sense of well-being in how we spend our days. So it's, a, as again, going back to what I was saying, I think, to Lori, it's actually exciting. Very, thank you. And over here. Yes, it's uh, Robert from Vancouver. Hi. Uh, I heard you mention food security a little bit earlier, and I wonder if you could talk a bit more about why Canadians should be concerned about food security as yeah. it relates to uh, global warming. Well, I think we're seeing it right now, Robert, in the, the, you know, with the horrific droughts in California, all Canadians, it's not just the falling loony, but the price of food is going up. A lot of the food in our grocery stores here in, in British Columbia, but across Canada, is grown in California. We're experiencing higher prices because we're dependent on another place, which is experiencing extreme drought due to climate change. The more that we are able to know how to grow our own food, and, and you know, in, in uh, in much of Canada, we have you know, very, very severe winters, but we could, we could be growing a lot more of our food in rooftop gardens. We could be growing a lot more of our food, even in urban areas. We could take more responsibility for making sure that we are able to produce food locally. It's not to say we wouldn't trade. I'm, I'm personally quite committed to continuing to drink coffee. That is a product that I don't expect to grow myself. Uh, there are a lot of things that I really love that we import, but it makes no sense whatsoever for Canada's grocery store chains to have nothing but garlic grown in China. Very hard to imagine since garlic grows everywhere in Canada. There are a lot of good examples of where we should be doing more for local food security. And of course, the lower we eat on the food chain, the more we reduce greenhouse gases as well. But it's just one of those issues that we haven't paid attention to for a long time because our agricultural sector and the department, the Federal Department of Agriculture Canada, and I don't know if we're going to get this shifted to soon, but Agriculture Canada's overwhelming directive to, has been to increase Canada's share of the export market of stuff that's so, sort of like food. So we export as much as we can. We're the world's biggest exporter of, of hogs and, and pork products, and that is at the cost of mega hog farms that have created massive eutrophication in Lake Winnipeg and, and bringing back eutrophication as a threat to the Great Lakes. We're seeing uh, a system of food growing and industrialized food growing, which actually is itself a bigger source of greenhouse gases than if we had the more decentralized farming, local, and, and we certainly need to figure out if we, if it's pretty obvious that if we want food locally or food at all grown in Canada, uh, farmers in Canada need to make a livable income on farm. Most Canadian farmers are, no, number one, is an aging population with no one clamoring to take over their dad's spot, uh, knocking themselves out day in and day out only to get more deeper in debt and not pay for things. Uh, and at the same time, that farming population while aging is also earning at least some to most of its income off farm. Farmers are now discovering, I have, I have a, my stepdaughter actually does a lot of marketing to help uh, agricultural, ag agricultural tourism. So things like it started with farmers who decided, I'm um, you know, not really making money, but since I've got all these pumpkins at Halloween, maybe I can do like a pumpkin fest and bring people in and they can pick their own. What's happening is that a lot of those farmers are discovering they make more money on agricultural tourism and petting zoos and letting people pick their own and this and that than they can possibly make growing food year round. There's something very strange about the dynamics of that. And if we want to have farming as something that people do for a living, they have to be able to make a living, and it may mean that we stop having, but the two directives of Agriculture Canada have been cheap food and exporting food. And I think we ought to reinsert into our lens for what healthy agriculture is, food security, healthy food, and more local food, 
and farmers being able to make a living on farm. So we'll give our last question to uh, Mr. Councillor Sue Maxwell. Hello. Oh, there we go. Thanks. Uh, so w in Whistler, we're taking a look at our uh, climate action plan and, and revising it. And so I'd be really interested, uh, you've mentioned some projects in, in your talk already, but I'd be really interested to hear from you about interesting projects or projects you think are innovative in uh, communities that are sort of maybe the same size as us or things that inspired you that you've seen happening in, in other places? Well, we are seeing a lot of increase in f seeing uh, plug-ins for electric vehicles. So EV vehicles are seeing a place in within a lot of communities in BC, and that's a very encouraging thing. I mean, again, in my riding, I see a lot of electric vehicles. I'm hoping there'll be more to encourage. You getting rid of the, you know, if you if, say bite-sized chunks, Anything that gets rid of using coal to produce electricity and gets rid of the internal combustion engine. So it's nice, it's a short list, it's just two things. <laughs> Get rid of those, we're, we're, we're good. Um, there are a lot of inspiring programs. I've got, oh well, just one, this isn't even a community, it's just one friend who happens to live in the Cowichan Valley and got enough solar panels on the roof and they've now gone through a couple years so they can absolutely demonstrate that they get all the electricity they need from their roof and they're now getting enough to also uh, charge up their car. And, I ha and there's, there's a lot of examples of that kind of thing as well. I'm as I said, I'm really encouraged that BC Hydro is now uh, letting people net out and get money back after putting in their own renewable energy sources. Um, communities that are doing cool things. I mean, I mean, I always loved it. It's a little, it's a little example, but a number of communities started having a walking school bus, which has the benefit of supervised walking of kids to get to school. So parents don't have to worry about. I don't really want my child to walk to school because I'm a helicopter parent and I'm really worried what's going to happen to them between the house and school. It's not unreasonable to be worried, but you have a walking school bus. You organize with a. Uh, the, the group of kids walking together so they get exercise, they get fresh air, and reducing greenhouse gases. It's a very healthy thing to do. So the more that we have examples like that that reduce our dependence on fossil fuels while increasing uh, connect personal connections, relationships, and health, it's nice that they, they tend all the things that one would want to do to reduce greenhouse gases tend to have uh, what you know, we, we used to talk about, um, and people still do talk about being in a vicious cycle. Well, there's a virtuous circle that happens when you start moving down the road to reduce greenhouse gases, and you find that while you weren't necessarily expecting it, you have an awful lot of wonderful benefits in terms of health, well being, community, uh, um, richness in a community, expanding that sense of loving where you live. Oh, one of the greatest examples of this, just in terms of a, an economic uh, renewal, was Curitiba, Brazil, which was one of the poorest places in Brazil. Nobody really wanted to live in Curitiba. Um, the mayor came along and there's an awful lot of garbage on the street and an awful lot of homeless people and poor people who couldn't afford the city bus. So he started with this really simple one idea that he would let the homeless people who collected garbage and got it to recycling could exchange it for a bus ticket. And then he began to realize we should stop the bus where people are because, you know, so anyway, with one thing led to another. If you Google Curitiba today, you find that it's one of the hot spots. It attracts investment. Young professionals want to live there. And it's all organized around a very efficient bus system that operates on spokes to a hub. And in the hub, they figured, okay, well, there's young professionals. They may live out there, but they after the, a day at work, they don't want to necessarily go all the way home to change for going out to the clubs. So let's, in the hub area where all the buses arrive, let's put in change rooms, lockers, and showers. Let's also, that would be a good place for the child care centers because then people can bring their kids in and when they go to work, they've got daycare centers that are at the hub of where they go anyway because that's where the bus takes them. Innovation sometimes can start with the simplest of ideas but rooting them in compassion and trying to think about society as a human family where you actually want to take care of everyone, that tends to actually increase uh, the benefits of reducing greenhouse gases and all of the, all the things we want to do anyway for a healthier society come more easily while we're also shifting away from fossil fuels. I don't know why it works that way, but I'm awfully glad it does.
Thank you, Elizabeth. I really loved that ending of um, couching climate action in the in the context of compassion and health. I think that's a really interesting way of of looking at the agenda and moving it forwards in different with um, people different things that people care about. So, um, our next. Uh, our next section for the evening is actually going to be with MLA Jordan Sturdy. Um, Jordan is uh, the chair for the um, BC Climate Leadership Team, and they've been busy putting together a series of recommendations um, on behalf of the province on climate action. So Jordan's going to give us an update on that and some um, key dates that you guys should be uh, keeping an eye on. Thanks, Jordan. Well, thanks. And um, <coughs> I have to say thank you to Elizabeth. That was just a fantastic overview of the last 20, 25 years. And it went from a personal perspective, I think I, I certainly learned a lot, and I'm sure that we all did, didn't we? Yes. Thank you very much. <coughs> So I am Jordan Sturdy, and it is my privilege to be your MLA, or for those of you who live in West Van to Sky anyway, and I'm also the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Environment. Thanks to AWARE for organizing this event. And um, uh, since the introduction of the Climate Action Plan in 2008, BC has been recognized as a, as a world leader in many ways in terms of the flight against, fight against climate change. We have shown that we can reduce greenhouse gas emissions while we continue to grow our economy. And it's essential that we continue to strike this balance uh, as we move forward in our climate agenda. BC was the first, uh, first jurisdiction in North America to introduce a broad-based uh, like revenue-neutral carbon tax and um, to have a carbon-neutral public sector. We're, in fact, I think the only jurisdiction in North America that has a carbon-neutral um, uh, government here in British Columbia and many carbon neutral uh, communities around the, the province as well. This is the fifth consecutive year here uh, that we have achieved carbon neutrality here in British Columbia, and it's a big accomplishment made possible by strong actions of the public sector across the province and, and uh, organizations, uh, many of which you belong to. Our public sector has built capacity, supported new projects, and encouraged the development and adoption of clean technologies. Local governments are clearly doing their part as well. 96% of local governments have signed on to the uh, BC Climate Action Charter, which commits local governments to being carbon neutral in their corporate operations. Importantly, to, to measure community-wide greenhouse gas emission, um, because if you, don't, uh, if you don't measure it, you can't manage it. And um, um, really importantly as well, creating complete, compact, and energy efficient communities. And this is something that is that every community around the province is looking at and um, um, acting on. And we did this here in the, in the regional district through the, the regional growth strategy. This is important because we know that local government is, has influence over somewhere around 40% of the greenhouse gas emissions here in British Columbia. We realize that more needs to be done provincially, nationally, and globally to combat climate change. Governments must lead the way, and we ask business and families, uh, or as we ask business and families, to make those sacrifices themselves. To ensure that BC remains a global climate leader, we're moving on our climate agenda through the development of a new climate leadership plan. And we're inviting families and citizens to tell us what they see and what in a new climate leadership plan because we want the plan to reflect the values of British Columbians. A strong climate leadership plan will help us take advantage of the low carbon economy of the future and um, many of the green jobs that Elizabeth talked about. This past summer, we engaged with public organizations, local governments, and First Nations with the first phase of consultation focused on understanding British Columbia's ideas, values, priorities for climate mitigation and adaptation through a discussion paper and a survey that I hope all of you participated in. If you didn't, don't worry about it. We have another phase coming up. The discussion paper outlined high-level approaches to the way we meet our reduction targets within four areas of action, how we live, how we work, how we travel, and how we consider the cost of climate change to society. We wanted to know what areas citizen be citizens believe requires the most immediate attention for us to achieve our short-term and long-term climate goals. We encourage people to read the discussion paper, fill out the survey, and submit detailed comments to government. Almost 6,000 British Columbians completed the Climate Leadership Plan discussion paper survey, sharing their views on climate action with government. Along with the survey results, 
government received over 300 personal submissions and some you know 200 uh, essentially form letter type of uh, submissions but and many of those 300 um, uh, written submissions were comprehensive and, and very interesting and did provide feedback to the climate leadership team as we created our recommendations for the new climate leadership um, program so the the leadership team consisted of about 15 16 representatives from um, uh, from the from academia, from the public sector, from um, industry, from local government, from First Nations, and um, from uh, uh, non-governmental organizations, uh, Clean Energy Canada and the like. And we worked on a consensus basis, so we put forward 32 uh, consensus-based recommendations to government, and they are currently under review. The, the gist of some of these, it was a fairly aggressive uh, set of recommendations. Um, and I won't go through all 32, but touch on some of them. It was, it was certainly reaffirming our 2050 targets, um, recommending the creation of a new set of 2030 targets, recommending for 2030 that we look at a 30% reduction in transportation emissions, a 30% reduction in industrial emissions, and a 50% reduction in built environment emissions. There's revenues generated through, um, uh, through the main tool, which I think we've all recognized has, has worked, and that is um, uh, the carbon tax. The recommendation was to increase the carbon tax at the rate of $10 uh, per, ton, um, per, um, per year. So $10 a year increase. So you know, by 2050, we're at $350 a ton. Right now, we're at $30 a ton. But we're also the jurisdiction that is that really has the only substantive carbon tax in North America. So, the, the, and there's a whole variety of other recommendations, and I'd encourage you to read that report, uh, read those recommendations, and this is what the comment um, opportunities in the, uh, the next stage of consultation will, uh, will be talking about. So in, in uh, and that brings me to a few days from now on Monday, they will be, will be launching the second round of public consultation on that climate leadership plan. It'll be open for 60 days, and in fact, there'll be two stages to it. But on Monday, I encourage you all to log into the climate leadership plan website, read the consultation guide, um, access the, the climate leadership team's recommendations, and, um, uh, and take the new survey and, and provide submissions to government. This round of public engagement will focus on potential options, timeframes to achieve GHG reductions in the targeted broad sectors of transportation industry and buildings, as well as the important um, aspect of adaptation. Concurrent with the, this public engagement, sector-specific industry consultations will also take place along with um, trying to grasp the, the, the uh, public perception and, and public desire through a polling process uh, done by Ipsos Reid. The final, cli final climate leadership plan will be released in the spring, wh which will include new climate actions to drive down emissions while supporting a growing economy. Last week, Premier Clark announced she will chair a new climate, or a new <coughs> excuse me, cabinet working group on climate leadership. And the formation of this group reflects one of the recommendations from the climate leadership team. This cabinet working group will help us to ensure that government's climate actions are current and there's a climate lens on all actions of cabinet and will ensure that we remain on pace to achieve our emissions reductions targets. BC's new climate leadership plan will shape how British Columbians uh, work, live and travel for decades to come. That's why it's important that you participate in this, pro in this process. And that's why we want to hear from you. So I encourage you all to participate in the development of the new plan um, and the website which I'm sure you'll be able to track down, but it's engage.gov.bc.ca forward slash climate leadership. So I look forward to hearing from you all. And you're certainly welcome to be in touch with my office with your thoughts as well. Thank you.
So just to um, build on that, we do have all of your emails. We will only use them once, I promise. Um, we'll send you the links to all of these consultations that are mentioned tonight so that you've got them easy to hand um, following on from this evening. So the other thing um, in relation to connecting with the climate leadership team and the plan for their recommendations um, is that Tim Leziuk, who is the executive director of the Climate Action Secretariat, is actually in the expo um, once we're done. And he was here earlier as well. So please do go and connect with him. He is the expert and he is um, also the man responsible for making sure we are hitting our provincial greenhouse gas emission targets. So um, he's a good person to connect with um, here this evening. So on to the final segment of the of the night. Um, we really wanted to have this be a discussion of the, you know, from the global commitments that were made in Paris to the community actions that were are being taken here in the Sea to Sky. So really happy to um, have had uh, all three of our mayors here from the Sea to Sky uh, keen to join us this evening. So thank you for being here. Really honored to have you. Um, and I guess uh, starting at the beginning, so maybe giving us a little bit of background as to what climate actions are underway within the community currently that you're excited about and that you're seeing big strides from and let's start let's go from C2 sky so we'll start with you Mayor Heitzman. <laughs> Hi thanks very much uh, to AWARE and again Elizabeth uh, Nancy and I were in a paddle, panel at a young woman with girls really um, this summer and uh, I think it was just um, Elizabeth just is a very inspirational person so I want to thank you very much and Jordan um, and I'm not blowing smoke up anybody's ass here Oops. Um, <laughs> Jordan's been uh, fantastic. I think he's got a little sunnier and a little nicer since he's moved to M Ministry of Environment because in Ministry of Transportation, just everyone asked him for money and, and that's not as fun. So I think he's enjoying it a lot more and he's certainly uh, been really um, fantastic for the District of Squamish. So I want to say thank you to, to Jordan. So just very quickly, um, Squamish sort of started on a bit of a carbon path uh, about 10 years ago. Um, it was actually a pledge I brought forward when I first became a counselor. And one of the things I discovered when I first became a counselor, it's really hard to sort of get initiatives done if you don't have overarching policy that are, that are helping staff move things forward and helping um, provide the framework for the other, you know, your cohort to actually move forward. So once I realized just throwing motions out there, trying to get, you know, active transportation going and recycling and composting, that type of thing, that you needed that overarching thing. And so uh, it was my simple way, but we did a 12-step climate action pledge back in 2006 into 2007. This was before the province brought forward their, their climate strategy. Um, and um, Prim Premier Campbell had sort of his epiphany, which was a very welcome epiphany, I must say. Um, I think we, we've kind of waned for a number of years. And I remember having a conversation with sort of your counterpart down in Squamish, the Squamish Climate Action Network. And it was before that was started and a uh, young woman uh, was trying to sort of get people interested and she had a few movie nights. And she said to me, what can I do? Like, what do you need me to do to help move these things forward in your local government? I said, you, you need to form this strong advocacy group that helps inform the local politicians and helps inform and make us do better in our jobs. And the Squamish Climate Action Network, I give them full kudos. They've done an amazing job for the last couple of years. Well, it's probably been about six years since they've been around. But you need that strong grassroots advocacy to make other levels of government better. So what we're doing now um, that's really exciting, oh, you know, I was, uh, we, just since 2011, um, we've reduced our operational carbon from 1,231 tons to 803. We made a big jump when we actually started implementing curbside organic um, collection. And that reduced our, uh, we, al that we were allowed to apply the 276 or so tons that we um, essentially are avoiding by diverting organics and making soil out of it onto our bottom line. But our, our landfill, which is everybody's waste pretty much in the quarter at some point, actually produces about 14,000 plus tons of greenhouse gas a year. So there's lots of room to improve on that front. Uh, we've reduced uh, organics into the landfill by about 13%. Um, we did an audit in 2012 that said about 56 plus percent is actually uh, compostable um, waste that does not need to just create methane. Uh, a few other things, uh, um, there's tons of little things, you know, solar for our crosswalks and all that sort of stuff. Um, we've done all sorts of efficiencies in our buildings. 
we're we we we're reducing our um, footprint at the uh, recreation center this year by 30 tons just in replacing gas-fired boilers and a whole bunch of sort of new innovation that's coming into how to run your pool to how to run your your arena so we're looking at 30 we're spending about 80 grand just to, re to reduce 30 grand of co2 at our at our recreation facility but I think we're the really, and you can stop because I'll just keep going on. So the, the <laughs> really exciting enough. thing um, in Squamish is sort of this new economy that's developing. So one of the things um, about a year ago, year and a bit ago, a company came to us and said, we're an Alberta Burton company out of Calgary saying, we're having trouble sort of getting going in Calgary. And they're scrubbing CO2 out of the atmosphere. And they're doing it down on our ocean front. And they said, we need to find a location to do that. And uh, through a, a bunch of connections, and I give kudos to um, uh, local developer Bethel, who actually brought them to us and said, hey, these guys would be a great sort of anchor tenant down on your ocean front. And so we facilitated that. And they've been there for a year. They've done some partnerships with um, um, Ministry of Energy in terms of trying to take the CO2 that's being scrubbed out of the atmosphere and actually converting it into fuel that will power the buses in Squamish. So it's, it, it'll be a carbon neutral fuel in that it's taking existing carbon. It will emit it in the end, but ideally if we can start to have these innovations happen that we're reducing our demand on fossil fuels to the point where we get off them completely, then this is a piece of it. But what this has happened is that now we're in talks with entities like UBC on how to use this as a hub and this was our key part of our submission. Look at Jordan's texting. He's tweeting. Mayor Heisman's awesome. <laughs> no. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> so, but um, this was our this was our key submission to the uh, climate leadership plan. Was this idea of really creating an innovation hub for clean energy down on our ocean front, and we partnered with UBC on that. Um, Bethel and uh, Newport, who is the developer on the ocean front, and uh, Carbon Engineering, who's doing this project. So it really is about the economy in that sense, and that I think is what's sort of really exciting. Can I do one more thing? One more thing. <laughs> so we've made a, we've actually committed to becoming carbon neutral in 2016. So this is the first time we've technically become carbon neutral. We set up carbon neutral reserve funds, so we've sort of been planning for it for a long time. But we're going to do it, and part of the, and I'm sure Nancy and, and Michael want to touch on this, part of the challenge is, in order to do that, we have to buy carbon offsets, and there's all sorts of issues with that. You know, is it just sort of offsetting what you should be, should be doing and all that sort of thing? But we're trying to create a local carbon marketplace, and kudos to Whistler for setting that up with their community forest. But we want, we're trying to create a local carbon offset, so you see the value added of reducing carbon in your community, and then the individuals can offset their flight to Toronto locally by investing in that company that's taking vegetable oil from all the restaurants in Whistler. And so you can stimulate that e e economic, the entrepreneurial side of thing and the innovation side of thing that, that Elizabeth talked about. So that's one step we're just, uh, we're just embarking on right now. I gave you that because you were kind of answering two questions in one. So <laughs> it's great. Go ahead. No, no. Uh, I just want to uh, start off as well by thanking uh, you, Claire, and AWARE for hosting tonight. Thank all of you for coming. Uh, but with this sellout crowd, it really uh, tells us that this continues to be a very important issue and an area of concern for everybody up and down the corridor. Thank you, Elizabeth. You're inspirational. That word's been said about four times already. You truly are. You're dedicated. You're a dog with a bone when it comes to the environment, and, and good on you. And uh, thank you, Jordan. I was trying to find a way I could work in RMI into this talk, but I'll, I'll leave you alone with that. Um, Whistler has been interested in climate change and G GHGs and uh, energy consumption for a long time. Um, Whistler was one of the very first municipalities in the country to join uh, the climate change program organized by the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. And we did that back in 1997, seven, if you can believe it. Um, as a result of joining that program, we developed a plan called the uh, Community Energy Air Quality and Greenhouse Gas Management Plan. And that was back in 2002. 
Um, so we've been on this file for a long time through the implementation of that plan. Uh, we've done things like uh, retrofit the Meadow Park Sports Center with um, uh, solar panels and uh, heat pumps, ground source heat pumps that uh, reduce greenhouse uh, gas emissions by 400 tons uh, per year. It also saved us uh, actually quite a bit of dough, so it was uh, good in that respect as well. Um, I do want to recognize and uh, commend the efforts of previous councils uh, under the leadership of Mayor Hugh O'Reilly and uh, Mayor Ken Melamed. Um, environmental issues were extremely important to those previous councils and, and we were able to achieve some very good things as a result. We've got uh, targets built into our official community plan. Uh, we want to reduce GHGs from two, 2007 levels by 33% by 2020, 80% by 2050, and 90% by 2060. Um, and between 2007 and 2012, we actually reduced our GHGs by 17%. We've got a lot of work to do. Um, we can't kid ourselves. Uh, but we've paid attention to these issues and uh, and we've done some very good work so far and I've got every confidence uh, that we will carry on doing so. Into the sky, Mary Richmond. <laughs> so Elizabeth, about halfway through your speech I decided I would behave somewhat awkwardly and nervously to just not to upstage you there because you, <laughs> you, you seem a little on LED, so just to explain that. Um, <laughs> One of the things that actually really hit a mark for me was when you, you were referring to Canada, but you, d you spoke about uh, punching above our weight. And one of the things that concerned me coming in here tonight was sitting with larger communities. We're a smaller community with an even smaller budget, uh, however, with very big ambitions. Um, and it's, I was very excited tonight to find out how we could translate much of what happened in Paris down to a local level, especially the communities the size of Pemberton. So your words of punching above your weight, I think, are very appropriate for our town uh, as the envi environment and natural landscape are at the heart of our community. So uh, <coughs> that was very encouraging to me. Um, and being important to our, our, our community, uh, for us as, a, as our council and previous councils, some of the things that have gone on, we are also signatories for the BC uh, Climate Action Charter. We participated in the Climate Action Revenue Incentive Program. Uh, we are one of, I think, 30 or 40 uh, carbon neutral communities uh, in the province. I think we've been so for two or three years now. Um, the enhancement, protection, and love of our natural environment for us in Pemberton is embedded in our policy at higher levels. Uh, it's one of the pillars for our OCP, our official community plan. Uh, it's front and center in our mission statement. And I think, you know, I think Patty spoke a little bit about the importance of having those overarching policy. That trickles down into policy and bylaws, be it some as small or still significant as uh, idling bylaws, how long a vehicle can idle for. Um, it trickles down into um, bylaws and policies that support protection of habitat and, and species at risk. Um, I think it's also evident in the way we support locally groups like Clean Air Society, uh, our very wonderful Stewardship Pemberton uh, group. Uh, we support, I think we're quite well known for our slow food cycle, which is um, you know, really important to, or central to food production and local food uh, production. Um, similar to the other communities, we, we, we've been doing things like looking at retrofitting street lighting, uh, finding ways to retrofit our buildings. Um, we're looking at renewable energy options for our signature park, which is One Mile Lake. Um, we're busy looking for funding partners and opportunities when it comes to cycling connectivity and pedestrian access, small town or not, that's all really important, even actually maybe even more so because our population is perhaps more spread out uh, and less dense than other, some of the bigger communities. So allowing people to get into town and creating good cycling infrastructure is really important. Uh, one of the you know, specific projects along those lines is what we call our friendship trail. Uh, this is a trail that we're trying to construct that, li that links Mount Curry to Pemberton and will allow for multimodal uh, transportation and get people off the road. Uh, as an organization, uh, we engage in GHD reduction programs like Bike to Work Week, 
uh, Earth Hour, that sort of thing. But I think a, a good example of what our organization does or a good reflection of how important it, us to, it, us, it is to us as an organization and as a community is we have something called the Green Team in, our, uh, in the VOP, in the Village of Pemberton. And this is a purely volunteer group uh, of staff that get together to figure out, amongst other things, um, ways to develop a corporate sustainability plan to reduce GHG emissions associated with our buildings, our amenities, uh, and our employee behavior. Over three quarters of our staff voluntarily sit on the green team. And I, I'll admit we don't have a massive staff, but I still, still think it's a very impressive number. Uh, there is a genuine and sincere desire to make the, any move we can, be it as a council, as an organization, as a town. And again, it was very comforting for me to hear the punching above the weight and, and the ability for towns like ours to, uh, to contribute in a meaningful way. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Richmond. It's interesting because I think you guys do, um, you know, there's lots of opportunity to punch above your weight in terms of the food security that Pemberton has to offer here in the Cedar Sky. And there was a lot of crossover in what you guys were talking about in terms of, um, you know, uh, uh, building spaces where people can innovate and create opportunities for themselves in terms of social entrepreneurship. Um, and what um, I wonder if we could expand on that a little bit more in terms of what you see as the key opportunities for um, people to kind of push the agenda. You, uh, Mel Heinz, when you spoke a little bit about grassroots organizations, so watch out, Nancy, we're coming for you. <laughs> um, but, you know, the, what, what can individuals here tonight really do um, as next steps in, in each of the communities here in the Sea to Sky? Well, yeah, um, I talked a little bit about that. I think when you look at it, it's about uh, one of our biggest challenges in Squamish is we have way too many commuters. And uh, we'd love to, and certainly working hard at how do we um, ensure that people aren't commuting. And they commute to Whistler too. So our goal is that all those people from Squamish that commute up to Whistler aren't commuting up to Whistler and aren't commuting down to Vancouver because there's a huge amount of, of emissions there. Um, Another thing, Squamish was the, the first uh, community in Canada to have a Tesla supercharger station. And we have DC Fast Charge, which I know you have up here, and a number of others. But I think personal decisions on vehicles is a huge piece of it. And, and how you um, use your home is a, a massive part of it. How, what kind of fuels you use to heat your home, how insulation is probably the best thing you can do to a home in terms of reducing your carbon footprint. Um, we're a little bit spoiled here in BC because our hydro is our, our primary electricity source is, is much better than most places. Um, so we kind of get away with um, maybe not doing as as good as we should there. Um, and obviously taking those making those decisions that aren't just ROI, um, you know, your return on investment, but actually evaluating over the life the lifetime of that investment, not just the return on that investment. So solar panels, Squamish just became a Canadian solar city, and, and some people laugh because, you know, it rains a little in Squamish sometimes. But uh, um, I think we really view it as a symbolic, and it, it's something to help confirm a, a responsibility, a global responsibility, a local responsibility. And it's a way of hopefully inspiring people to go, okay, we can, we can do it, whether it's solar or wind. I mean, everything comes from the sun, doesn't matter if you're a fossil fuel or a solar power, but idea a renewable solar power. So that's how we sort of couch that. So there's lots of stuff that individually you, you can do, absolutely. Uh, of course, I agree with Patty. And um, the, two, the two big issues for us are transportation, as they are for most communities in the corridor, and, um, and buildings. Uh, but what you can do um, with, uh, so individual choices, of course, really come into play here. Uh, with respect to your buildings, I would encourage you all to go out, if you haven't done so already, go out to the expo after this program's over and uh, have a look at the, um, uh, the uh, audit that you can have done of your house. Um, there's a booth out there and Luke actually came to our house last fall and uh, we had an audit done, and um, I was actually horrified to see how many um, places there were um, where energy and, and warm air and so on was, le was leaking out of our house. I thought we had a pretty uh, well-constructed and airtight house. Uh, as a result of that audit, 
um, we made some very targeted decisions about uh, re-insulation and so on, and we've noticed it drastically this winter with our um, our energy bills. Um, the municipality has a rebate program. The audit costs about $350. The municipality is running a rebate program so you can get $250 back from, from that uh, audit. So it really is a no-brainer and it does have uh, immediate ramifications for uh, most people. I would also, and this seems kind of a dumb thing to say given the fact that all of you people are here, but uh, I would also encourage engagement and there are many, many opportunities. Uh, there's one coming up in the next short while and that's with our community action plan. Uh, we will be going out for community consultation um, and this is the updating of a, of a plan uh, left over from 2004. It's an important plan. We've got a citizens advisory group who are working on the plan now, but we certainly will be looking for community co consultation, so please do get in, become engaged, more engaged than you already are. So I don't want to, I don't want to be redundant. There, there's a, a ton of things that we can do as individuals from purchasing choices, uh, the packaging, where the product comes from, uh, to buying locally, to commuting and all that sort of thing. We in local government have a responsibility to do our best to provide the best transit possible so that people can make those decisions. We're currently working with the regional district on a solid waste management plan with the hopes of uh, really increasing our diversion rates. Uh, Pemberton hosts uh, a, uh, an awesome composting facility um, just outside of town. So there's a lot of things in place, and then it falls back to the individual responsibility. But I mentioned earlier our group called Stewardship Pemberton, and they do the work they do as a community group is everything from uh, protecting fish habitat to running uh, camps for children. And the, and the camps are about being in the outdoors, about understanding the fish, about knowing the habitat. and uh, I'll probably get the exact wording wrong, but they have one of their catch lines in their uh, marketing, we'll call it, is you can't love what you don't know. And that really sticks with me in the sense that in a community like ours, where so many of us were either drawn to the area because of the natural landscape and the beauty, or those that have grown up here over or in Pemberton over generations and have been part of food production and agriculture, Having that link, having that knowledge, that understanding, that intimacy with our environment, I think is where it starts. Um, and that helps motivate all these personal choices, be it through purchasing or taking the bus. Um, but that's the kind of awareness and engagement that I think is really important to spread from person to person. Thank you, and that is a perfect final point for us this evening, really bringing it back to youth and um, getting, getting future generations and our generation involved in that place we call home and taking care of it. So thank you all this evening. Um, I would love to um, thank you for being here. Um, I'm just going to do a few um, thank yous. Firstly, to uh, the Honourable Elizabeth, Elizabeth May. Um, really great, fascinating insights into the ups and downs of the years of the, the, the COP conferences. Um, and also, um, thank you for the hope that you've brought in terms of the, um, the current context and what we should be feeling now as we pursue um, climate actions. Jordan, thank you for giving us the provincial picture, um, letting us know about the opportunity to get engaged in, our, in the climate leadership efforts at the provincial level. And to our three mayors, thank you so much for keeping us up to speed with what's happening locally here in the community and the opportunities to get engaged. As I did say, we will make sure that any um, opportunities for um, public input or we send you the links and uh, over email so that you've got those. So as a sign of our appreciation for your being here tonight and traveling the Sea to Sky Highway in the variable conditions that were today, um, we have a gift for each of you. So um, I'd like to invite uh, Randy to the stage. So these are actually um, pieces of local art from a Whistler-based social enterprise. Um, you may recognize them as skis. Um, because that's exactly what they are. Um, skis are a real mix of materials. Um, so generally they're, they're, they end up in a landfill or for those of you who live here in Whistler on the fence at the Reusit Center. Um, so Ski Heaven takes old skis and they give them a second lease on life as art or useful things. So they're gonna bring them on now. So um, they're all the same, you don't have to fight over them. Um, um, for our gift skis, 
Um, for our gift skis, um, for those of you at the back who can't quite make out the wording, um, we chose the quote, the mountains are calling and I must go. Um, it's a famous quote uh, that resonates very strongly with those of us who love being here in the mountains, but it's also from renowned naturalist John Muir. Um, uh, he was a naturalist of the flora and fauna kind, not the taking your clothes off kind, though. <laughs> Who's to judge? So we all but just... And uh, yes. So thank you, everyone. Please go ahead. So Ski Heaven do have a booth in the expo for anybody who wants to check out their, their some of their pieces. Elizabeth, I'm not too sure how that's going to go on the ferry ride home tomorrow, but we'll uh, we'll help you with that if need be. We can send it to you. <laughs> um, so we do have a few thank yous to share because, as we know, these events take a team to pull off. Um, I'd really like to thank Tourism Whistler um, and the conference center. Thank you. Um, Amy Huddle, uh, who is around somewhere, um, she has been fantastic in helping us get organized for this event and the Tourism Whistler support of um, when we, as soon as we came to them and said, hey, we want to have this climate change forum, um, bringing in the global commitments to community action, they said, yes, we want to help. So um, really amazing to have them step up. Um, and also for all the AV, he's taken care of everything from putting microphones in our hands to the lighting. Um, Ed uh, Hugel at Freeman Audiovisual, who's up the back there and has taken great care of us today. Um, also like to thank Peak News Magazine, um, Diana Mulvey of Seeds Consulting, uh, Ruth Barrow of Whistler Creative for helping us with all the advertising and promotion, Brad Castleman, thanks Brad, blind me while I'm talking about you, um, um, from Coast Mountain Photo who's here to, um, capturing this evening. Um, also really like to, thinking back to the beginning of the evening, um, thank Ken Melamed for his two minute challenge of an introduction. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Josh and Shuta Chem from the Squamish Lillowat Cultural Center for their welcome and opening blessing. Um, I'd like to thank the AWARE board and the more than 20 people who've given their spare time to help prepare for and help us host this event this evening. Um, from doing everything from putting up posters to social media. Um, whether you gave a little bit of time or a lot of time, seriously, it all means a huge amount to us, so thank you so much. Personally, I'd also like to thank Steph Hubbard, who's at the back there, because every time we sign up for one of these crazy events, she steps up and says, I'll help. Um, she generally works on some of our projects, but she really does share the load, so thank you, Steph. Um, we'd also like to put special thanks out to everybody who's here and helping in the expo, uh, the Solutions Expo out in the foyer. Um, it's really fantastic to have um, everyone here helping uh, us move us along, sharing their knowledge and experience for options for climate solution with us. So thank you, all everybody who's out there hosting a table. Finally, <laughs> on behalf of the AWARE Board, I'd like to thank you, our audience tonight. Um, we hope that you've each found um, inspiration and um, a climate action that you can connect with in your own personal lifestyle, home, business, or community, and that you'll take that away with you and, and find a way to, um, to make it happen. I will mention that if anyone is feeling really keen to get involved in climate and or um, environmental action here in Whistler, AWARE is currently um, inviting nomination to join our board and our committees. So um, if anybody's interested in that, we do have an AWARE table um, out in the foyer. Uh, deadline for nominations is the 27th. So please, if you're interested in getting involved in a group like ours, the opportunity is right there. Um, if you want more information, not tonight, but when you get home and you think about it later, uh, just go to www.awarewithcert.org. Um, but for now, we invite you to connect with tonight's speakers in the expo. Um, please do check out all of the tables that are out there. Be sure to make a climate pledge in the Instagram photo booth, very high tech um, Instagram photo booth. Um, and for any of you who are traveling north and south on the highway, please do have safe travels home. Thank you everyone for joining us here. Please enjoy the rest of your evening.